Hi, I'm Larry Puckett, the DCC guy. Today we're going to continue working on the base for the Helix right here. You'll notice that it's been magically levitated up off the floor so I can do some work on it. But at this point, we're ready to install the legs. I've already pre-cut those, so we can go ahead and get started with that fairly quickly. Then the other thing we're going to do is we need to start preparing for the actual pieces of curved road bed. So hang on and we'll get started with that in a minute. But once again, I want to remind you, if you haven't already subscribed to the channel, it's real easy. It's free. It only takes a second. So all you have to do is hit that little red uh, subscribe button. And when the little bell comes up, click on it and click all. Thanks now. <laughs> Okay, I do have a couple of, of quick feedback comments for you. Now, these relate back to the design uh, episode. But what I got back was that basically the math was correct. There weren't any major issues. There's little decimal dust issues. But as the uh, mathematician who wrote back told me, uh, when you actually look at the numbers, it's irrelevant in this type of situation. So I'm not worried about it. The other reason I'm not concerned is because I built in a considerable amount of leeway as far as installing this helix. If you remember from this diagram here, and I can get it up here close enough so that it's not washed out, I have a long straight tangent here that goes over to the end of the uh, layout. And I have another long straight segment here that goes over to the bottom section of the, uh, of, of the layout. And what that translates to, there's about 11 feet between the end of the helix over there and the end of the layout over there. And that gives me about two inches of slope in order to meet the helix itself. And then down here on the bottom, from the point where the helix is actually going to start all the way back to the beginning of the staging yard, which is the first zero point elevation that I have to worry about, I've got close to 30 feet and all of that could be on a slope. So that gives me something on the order of six inches there and two inches on the back. I've got somewhere around eight inches of up or down play that I can use to adjust the approach to the helix. So it's not a big concern. Now, the situations where you might run into problems like that are where you have already built the layout to the point where the helix is going to be attached to it. And then your measurements and calculations need to be dead on. Now the way that David Pop was able to test that out uh, in the Canadian Canyons Project Railroad, he built a cardboard mock-up of the actual uh, roadbed and the risers and tried it out before he started cutting the plywood and making the final adjustments for the helix itself. So going into laying the roadbed and putting in the risers and all of that, he already had tested it completely using a cardboard mock-up. So that's one way that you can go about testing out uh, the helix position and calculations uh, that you've made up front. Another way, of course, is to use a program like CAD Rail because then you can design it in the virtual environment of your computer, test out the helix, make sure everything is going to fit out, you know, print out a full scale plan of it, lay it on your bench top and start building from there. And that way you're going to be dead on accurate too. Okay, enough of the feedback. Let's go ahead and get started with installing the legs on the module. Okay, first let's talk a little bit about the legs because they are what we're going to be working on today. Uh, basically, the end of the layout, bottom layer, is at two feet above the floor. So I cut these uh, two by twos, 23 and a half inches long, and then installed the little adjustable metal feet here that I use on the entire rest of the layout. I showed th these and, and how to install these when I did the modules. So you could actually go back and take a look at adding legs to the modules and it's the same process. And I've used these everywhere on the Piedmont Southern as well as the modules for adjustable feet. So I will be able to adjust this up 
a slight bit using these adjustable screw down feet. So let's move in here now and take a look at where these are going to be located here on the model railroad because I did make some slight adjustments in what I planned to do. Now one other thing I'll point out to you is if you look here you'll notice that this leg that used to be here is no longer there. It's actually over here. I moved it. But over here on this side you'll notice over here I put in that additional leg that I was talking about and let me show you it is attached to one of the frame members underneath the uh, layout here. So I can actually pull this one out and the layout is self-supporting now. So that's eventually the way this will be set up with a leg down there and a leg in here and that's going to support this and make sure that nobody manages to collapse it. I've got this in place just in case. Because you never know, I might reach up and grab the bottom of the layout and pull it down on me if I'm not careful. So that is there for that purpose. Okay, let's go ahead and start with the legs. I'm going to go ahead and drill a couple of holes here in the upper portion of the, uh, um, of the leg so that I can attach it directly to the main member here of the base itself. So I've got to do four of those and then we'll be able to drop this sucker back down to the floor level and it'll be easier to work with, I think. Another thing that I have decided to do, I told you I was going to put in eight legs to make this totally self-supporting. I decided against doing that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to attach it to the wall studs along the back here and also along the side over here. And that way it's not going to get jostled around if somebody happens to bump into it. It's going to be very stable because it's going to be attached to the wall studs uh, in the back and on the side. So with that amount of support provided at the walls, I really don't need a lot of additional support on the outer edge. I think I will put one right about here and maybe another one somewhere here on the front edge as well. Um, this is going to be recessed far enough back under the layout, at least six inches, that nobody is, is likely to trip on it or kick it or anything of that nature. So I'm not too concerned about either of those factors. Okay, so let me go ahead and we'll pull out my drill and start drilling some holes for these. Okay, so let's go ahead and drill some holes. I'm going to put two on one side and one on the other for a good rigid support. Uh, and we'll also add some uh, cross braces uh, underneath here. I'll come back here in a minute and we'll uh, countersink all these holes. Okay, so that's got the basic holes. Now I want to countersink them. Okay, so that's got the holes prepared in all of the legs. So now I need to start back in here and we'll get them installed. Okay, I've got one of my uh, quick grip clamps and I'm going to go ahead and clamp this leg in place and we'll get it screwed in. Okay, that's got it clamped firmly in place so I'm going to go ahead and hit it with a couple of uh, screws. Okay, now we'll pop that one out and we're going to run an additional screw in from the side. So we'll have three attachment points here. One down, three more to go. Okay, well for this one, in order to get back in there, I had to dig out my old mechanics creeper. Okay, so. Sorry, I'm going to be working with my back to you. So now let me see if I can stand up in. Okay. And it was a bit noisy, but it worked. Well, I've got my trusty old level here, so let's see how close we came. Okay, it's dead center there dead center there, dead center there, and we're dead center there. 
I'm going to assume that with all of these dead center and level that the back is as well. Okay, so at this point we got the good stable base built. It's on its own four legs. As I said, I'll add some cross braces here uh, in the future, but we're not going to worry about that right this minute. Now that we've got the legs installed on the base uh, and have a good stable platform to start building on, we need to go ahead and think about creating the sections of roadbed that we're going to use to make the loops on the helix. And for that, we first need to create a pattern because we want all of those sections that are going to make up the loop to be as identical as possible. And, you know, you cannot create a 360 degree loop. Uh, well, you could, but it would eat up a lot of plywood real fast. You would only get uh, two of those for every sheet of plywood that you purchase. Whereas if you use something like a third of a loop or even a quarter of a loop, you can get a lot more of those out of each sheet of plywood. Probably, I'm, I'm hoping, something on the order of four or five or six even out of each sheet of plywood. I don't know that yet. Um, but that's one thing to be aware of. You cannot just cut out entire loops and then stack them and put the risers and that's it. You have to cut out individual sections that you will fit together with splice plates and then put risers to bring them up to the correct height. So for that, we need to create a pattern. So that's what we're going to do in this second segment of the video today. We're going to create a pattern that we can use to cut out identical sections of roadbed to go here on the helix and make up the loops. And for that, I'm going to be doing quarter turns because that way I can get the maximum number of roadbed sections from each piece of plywood. It's going to mean that I'm going to have to do more joints, but I'm willing to spend the time instead of spending the money. So what I've put together here is something that Jeff Johnson uh, did in his original article for Model Railroader that I mentioned earlier, and he put together a trammel. And this right here is a trammel right here. So basically what I've got is a piece of one by four laid across the opening here so that it is perfectly centered in the opening both ways. So basically then, I've just created a big compass. I've taken a piece of wood strip that I picked up at, the, at Home Depot and I have attached it to the dead center. So right here is the dead center of the helix itself. And then I've marked off positions here that are 27 and a half inch radius, 30 inch radius, and 32 and a half inch radius. Now, if you remember in the design uh, section, I told you that I was going to be using a 30 inch radius for the road bed. And I was going to have something on the order of five inches wide total for the road bed. So that's why I've got 30 inches set out right here for the center of the track line. And then the 27 and a half and 32 and a half will be the outside of the road bed itself. What I'm going to do with this is uh, I've drilled holes at each one of these positions. I've got a pencil. I'm just going to put the pencil in here and run this around in each one of these holes. And that way I will have a pattern uh, on the cardboard that will give me 27 and a half, 30 and 32 and a half inch radii. So watch how this works, and I think it'll be easier to understand. And it's very simple to lay this out, just a bunch of measurements. But remember, measure twice, cut once. Always verify. Never, ever do any cutting or anything else without having measured it twice. And that's an old carpenter saying, uh, always. Measure twice, cut once. Make sure you get it right the first time. Okay, let's go ahead. I'm going to bring this over here to this side, and I've clamped down my piece of cardboard so it's not going to move on me. And I'm going to have to stand up to do this, I think, knock my stool out of the way. So I'm going to put my pencil here at 30 inches, and we'll go ahead and start marking. So it's just like using a great big compass. So we'll sweep it around here. and. That gives me the 30 inch radius mark. 
Okay, now I'm going to go ahead and go back to 27 and a half. So this is the inside of the road bed. Looks like my pencil went through there. Okay, and then we'll switch out to 32 and a half, which is the outside here. Okay, coming around for the outside edge of the road bed itself. and bring this around here. And finally, to get all the way to the corner here, I'm gonna to have to take my clamp off, and we'll finish off these radii. There, 32 and a half, 27 and a half. Okay, let me make sure I've got a full, okay, we've got a good heavy dark line all the way around, which is what we needed. Now, at this point, I'm going to leave this trammel set up because once I go ahead and uh, cut out the pieces of road bed, I'm going to need to mark the center line for the road bed for my track. And the easiest way to do that accurately is to use this trammel that I've just created. And I'll be able to lay my pieces of road bed here and here and then run the trammel around and we'll be able to mark out the exact center uh, of the uh, of the road bed for the track itself. It probably took me about an hour to create this uh, setup, this trammel, but it's very easy. Let me take this out now that I've created the pattern. You can see a little bit clear, more clearly what it is. So it just sweeps around like this and allows you to transfer these markings onto whatever piece of material you want. So it's just a big compass like you used in school. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is get out my X-Acto knife and cut this out. So I'll show you that in a minute. Okay, I went outside and laid out a piece of board, a piece of uh, plywood, and using my box cutter uh, knife, I went ahead and cut out the template. Now we'll be able to use this template, lay it on the piece of plywood that I'm gonna use to cut out uh, roadbed sections, and then I can just run a pencil around the outside of the template, and we'll have a pattern to cut to. And then I'll be able to cut all of those out. Now one of the issues with this is you can go with anything from about a quarter of a turn up to, say, a half a turn. Uh, with in-scale layouts, I know on the uh, um, on the Canadian Canyons Project Railroad, which was in scale, David Pop uh, did half sections. And I think he was able to get nine half sections out of each four by eight foot sheet of plywood. And the way he calculated that in advance was, or figured this out in advance, he created everything on a scale model. He went ahead, created a template like this, only full half circle, and did that in scale, I don't know what scale he used, and then he just took a piece of paper and drew a scale four by eight foot sheet of plywood, and then just laid the template, the scale template, on the um, uh, scale model of his four by eight foot sheet of plywood, and drew, uh, drew outlines, and did this a number of different times until he found a way to get the largest number of sections from that piece of plywood. So that's going to be it for this video. We've got the legs here on the uh, baseboard, and it's a good stable platform on which to build our helix. And I've created the trammel behind me here. Can't see it now, but it's there. And uh, created the template for the sections of roadbed. And we'll be, as I said, we'll be using this trammel again to transfer this center line uh, onto each piece of roadbed so that we'll have a true 30 inch radius here for our track when we start laying that. And then um, I guess next week what we'll be doing is I'll be uh, going and picking up that um, sheet of plywood that I'm going to use, a couple, actually I'm going to pick up two or three sheets of plywood, even though I think they're about $60 a sheet now for decent plywood. So it's going to be an expensive project here. We'll be putting in some risers for the initial lap around here, for the initial loop to get us up to the first three inches. And um, hopefully 
we'll be able to also install the first piece of road bed on those risers. So have a great week and uh, come on back next week for another video from the DCC Guide. Bye now.